everyone. Uh, I'd like to thank the organizing committee for allowing uh, me to present our work. It's been developed at FCT Nova in collaboration with three other laboratories um, and pertains to forming dehydrogenases. Uh, everybody knows about the CO2 problem, so I'll not waste any more time uh, with that. But uh, the key thing is that formic dehydrogenases can be used to uh, convert CO2 to formate, which would then be used to multiple purposes and could help uh, fight um, climate change. The, this enzyme, uh, it's a metal enzyme, it contains a uh, tungsten center and four uh, iron sulfur clusters and it's particularly active when compared with other FDHs and also quite sensitive to oxygen. So we want to know why it's sensitive, why it's more active and so we uh, did an experiment in which we used FDH reduced crystals okay, um, to try to determine why FDH uh, inactivates upon exposure to oxygen. So, curiously, if we use those crystals and incubate with oxygen, we revert back to the oxidized um, form without any damage. And we also tried using formate, which is the substrate, in the buffer and also exposed to CO2, uh, to oxygen, sorry, and it would also revert back to the oxidized form undamaged. So we are still not getting the inactive form that we wanted to characterize. So we left it there more time and after two hours we could indeed characterize the inactive state in which the catalytically relevant selenocysteine moves away from the tungsten and uh, the oxygen ligand is introduced. And we can actually see here that the kinetic assays prove exactly this. Now, we, are, we were left wondering if this would just happen with the formate or if it would happen also with the other substrate, which is CO2. So we went to the SRF and we incubated the oxidized crystals with CO2 and curiously, we also obtain the same inactive form, which proves basically that the tungsten uh, redox state doesn't matter very much to the obtention of the inactive state. What's critical is the presence of the substrate, either one, and the oxygen simultaneously, and then you get the, active, the inactive state, which is what we wanted in this study, but generally what we don't want uh, when trying to use this enzyme in industrial purposes. So we were also interested in finding a way to protect this enzyme from oxygen. So we turned to an age-old question that it's, it was wide, it's widely known for some decades, which is that most FDHs require pre-activation with DTT to attain maximum activity. And it wasn't known why that occurred. So we also knew that most reductants can't perform this activation, but the DT can. So we were left wondering if it would be maybe a disulfide bond. And indeed, there is a disulfide bond, but is 25 angstroms away from the active site. So would it be this that conferred these properties? So we did a mutation that prevented the formation of the bond, and we could indeed confer that uh, kinetically the behavior was the same for the mutant and for the wild type pre-activated with DTT. And the same behavior could also be observed between the wild type activated with DTT and the cysteine in terms of um, sensitivity to oxygen. So how could a bridge that's so far away from the active site uh, could influence uh, the activity? 
So we solved the protein, the, the structure of the protein, uh, to a resolution of 1.4 angstroms, and we went looking. So we could see that from the bond all the way to the active site, multiple conformational changes occur that transduce the signal from the bond all the way to the active site. Looking closer, you'll actually see that uh, two residues shift positions and start interacting with the MGD cofactor that coordinates the metal site and a methionine which moves rather closer to the catalytically relevant uh, selenocysteine. And this has an impact in the structure and the geometry of the active site, therefore accounting for the changes in behavior both in activity and CO2 and oxygen sensitivity. Now, we also wanted to check if this was not an artifact that we were uh, investigating just in vitro. So we turn to the living cells of the bacteria and we collected a time point zero in which the cells were in their normal growing conditions, which is in the absence of oxygen. And you can see here in green you have the activity of the enzyme without uh, adding DTT and in blue the same but adding DTT. And since they are virtually the same, it means that almost or every FDH that's in the bacteria is in its active conformation, which makes sense since the bacteria is growing. But then, if we challenge the bacteria with a seven minute oxygen exposure, you'll see the decrease in both activities. But the thing is, the activity of the extract without DTT is nearly zero, which means that even the protein that could still be functional is somehow shut off. But you still have a slight amount of protein that was preserved by this mechanism. And upon a return to an, an oxygen condition, you can revive the protein again. You'll also see that the total active enzyme is greater, which means that the cell produced more enzyme or somehow recuperated the one that got inactivated, but you also see an increase in the activity when you don't have to activate. And if you leave it more time in the oxygen, you'll see basically the same behavior in which the, um, the activity of the extract itself is nearly zero, which means there are no active enzymes, but there are some uh, percentage of the FDH that's safeguarded by this redox switch. So basically what we propose is that there is a bridge, a disulfide bond, that when it's open in its reduced form, um, the enzyme is very active, but very vulnerable to oxygen. On the other hand, if we close the bond, we get a much less active but much more protective enzyme. This uh, could be explained by the difference in affinity towards substrate. We have established that substrate and oxygen must coexist in the medium to uh, yield an inactive FDH. And therefore, by reducing the affinity towards the substrate, we can um, virtually or actively protect the active site from the damage that oxygen could create. And this is a key um, aspect of this bacteria since it can uh, prevent uh, cell damage and death upon transient exposure to oxygen, which is a challenge that this species frequently encounters in its native habitat. And finally, towards the conclusions, basically say a bit of some of what I said before, and that in future we would like to better characterize the inactive state and also how exactly does this mechanism that transfers the signal from the bond to the active site occurs. And I would like to thank the members of our lab and 
ITPV, ASRF, and Marseille. Thank you.